So, uh, so going to the uh, topic that has been uh, given to me, uh, obviously uh, we wrote up the topic, so and uh, uh, we were hunting for cl a clinician to give insight on this. Uh, we couldn't find anybody, so it fell back on me who wrote up the title. So I am here talking to you about this. So uh, first of all, I don't have any formal training in AI. Whatever that I'm going to speak to you today is whatever we have learned by uh, asking questions, which are listed here, which I will detail, and uh, starting up our lab with good support from our admin and my department. And uh, also, uh, simultaneously, I was involved in uh, launch of our teleconsultation services, so I, I understood how we capture data and how we store data. So all this worked together to uh, uh, actually uh, design this meeting and, and then bring all of you together. So in the next 20 minutes, uh, I'm trying to give you a clinician's purview because you have heard about uh, what a data scientist talks talk to you about AI. Then afternoon, you heard a computer scientist tell you about AI. And now uh, it might be repetition, but I might I will tell you my uh, perspective or understanding of AI. So uh, also through this, I will uh, introduce some questions that we have asked and help you uh, or guide you on some of the types of AI that we use in healthcare. Also, uh, what is the relevance of technical expertise and communication, data sharing, and what are we going to look forward to? So what is AI? Simple definition, computer able to perform tasks requiring human intelligence. Uh, so to start off for a clinician, how is computer, uh, there is human brain and there is computer intelligence or, or machine intelligence. So human brain is massive, it can do multiple things simultaneously, but when we pass on this intelligence to the machine, we don't have to pass on, we don't have to duplicate the human brain, we just have to be task oriented. So that's, that makes it simpler. So. Uh, for example, if, if you design a machine to go from point A to point B, it will con you write a code for it and it will continuously do that repetitively until it finds an obstacle on its path. And then it stops. So if you enable the machine to, to understand the obstacle and work a way around it using without hard coding it, like allowing it to learn by it and then do it, then that becomes an intelligent action. So that is what intelligence is that is logic with reasoning which is directing the subsequent action so passing on that to machine is machine intelligence so i just list out the traits of an intelligent person on the blue side and we don't have to transfer all of these to the machine we just have to have a few things so uh, yesterday we we saw one machine um, beating a go player or a chess player so we don't want that machine to pass humorous jokes in between or pass sarcasm in between. So that is a human job. So they are task oriented and machine just need to learn from the mistakes on that domain and then do better. So this is artificial intelligence in my view. So where are we now with AI? So this is the AI evolution in comparison to a human brain. Uh, we are at the end of artificial narrow intelligence and what we can achieve is machine consciousness, probably that's what you saw in uh, the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie kind of thing. No, we are not anywhere there. So before I go on to the questions, it is very important to my fellow clinicians and people in uh, healthcare to tell you some of the basic jargon that we use in um, uh, AI. Uh, so first of all, what is big data? It's a collection of data that is huge in volume and growing exponentially with time. So if you take up the CMC's HIS and the volume of data that we have over 20, 22 years, that is big data because every hour, thousands of clinicians are adding to it, thousands of patients are adding to it, there is billing data, there is multitude of data that is coming in. And it, it's huge value and uh, it, is, it is diverse. Not only about clinical aspects, the billing aspects, uh, insurance aspects, everything is fed into that HIS. So maybe if I criticize that, what, what, would, what do I see as lacking in that is probably a bit of uh, ver uh, veracity because some of us, that, that's because doctors are poor record keepers. So clean data is probably something which we don't possibly have there. 
then we have to talk about data silos. So data silos are collection of data held by one group which is not easily accessible by another group. So this is commonly seen across institutions and also sadly within institutions also we all hold our data and we are very reluctant to share with the next person. So this is something which is a hindrance for AI research. So machine learning, this is my viewpoint and this is the definition. It's a set of algorithms that learns the input-output relation by itself without hard coding. I explained to you that in the machine aspect. And deep learning is a subset of machine learning. <coughs> it is machine learning but a subset. So what is the difference between the, these two? Andre showed you this yesterday, this picture about the car, where he said the deep learning model does not have a human element to it, while uh, machine learning that is heavily uh, controlled by human. So if I am going to teach my clinical student what is the um, uh, difference between machine learning and deep learning, I would use the library analogy, which is <coughs> So, for example, Dr. JVP, who is an avid uh, critical care uh, um, clinician, he has a new, fresh MBBS student who is coming into your clinic. And you want to, I mean, let's, let's use him as a simple machine, call him a simple machine, and you want to actually train him on a task of taking the patient off a ventilator. And that's your specific task that you are telling the person. So what you do, you take him to the library, you spend your time, select three books. Give it to him, tell him, see, use these books, look at my patients, uh, look at what I have treated earlier, the patients that I brought out from coma or ventilator, and then uh, learn and come back to me. So he does that and comes back to you in two weeks. You test him on a fresh patient and you are happy and you employ him. So that's a simple method of machine learning where the machine is now trained by you and then taken for validated and then taken forward. In a deep learning method, you're actually telling him, see what I want you to do is to go to the library and learn about this task and come back to me. So he goes to the huge library, it may not be the dot library, it is a huge, large repository of everything. He goes through everything and he comes back to you after two months because it's an extensive, exhaustive ta task. And then you ask him to learn from your patients using the library uh, thing, and then, then you try to test him by applying it. So most of the time he does a good job, but sometimes you see some weird behavior. Like for example, uh, to just put it in a lighter way, if, you, uh, if there's a pregnant lady who is comatose and he's asking you, where is your car, bring the battery, uh, let's charge the patient and get, get her out, because probably the library had copies of the movie Three Idiots. And you have a copy of Tamil, in, uh, Hindi, Telugu versions, and which is heavily reviewed and many people have recommended it also. And this particular scene is also heavily quoted. So the machine has learned that. And you, you having not known or have not seen the movie, you are wondering why the machine, why the person is actually asking you this question. So it is an uncontrolled learning process. So this is what we call uh, is the lack of explainability in a deep learning model or <laughs> interpretability in a deep learning model and sometimes we end up being the fourth idiot. So that's the difference between deep learning and uh, machine learning. So quickly about radiomics, yesterday it was explained. Uh, I just want to bring in another view. Radiomics is basically uh, not using the images qualitatively but converting it into quantity. So it, it actually integrates very well with the radiation oncology workflow because we generally annotate these images into three-dimensional volumes and I can actually get out data of size, shape, texture, intensity, margin, all those as numbers from these images and then use them to predict outcome. If I'm, if I'm using them to predict a survival outcome or a recurrence of a tumor, then that is a prognostic modeling. But if I use that information to actually identify between a squamous cell carcinoma or an adenocarcinoma in lung, that is a classification AI. So there are various applications in radiomics. <laughs> so now let's go through some of our projects. <coughs> our uh, lab basically was set up uh, first, from, by asking one simple one question, main question in head and a cancer, and it now runs on two projects which are funded, and s other projects which are unfunded but relevant to us. <coughs> so it all started with a primary clinical question where we felt that in head and a cancer we don't have biomarkers like in lung cancer which will actually predict the outcome for the patient, but um, 
but there is a huge volume of CT data which uh, we, we annotate and keep. And at the point of defining the tumor, if the clinician is able to know that the radiation will work on this patient or not, then it would actually change his decision making. If he knows that it doesn't work, he can either escalate the treatment or he can say radiation is useless, let's go for chemotherapy or something else. So there is a relevance to that, that information that we can get using AI. So we, we asked this question and it was funded by DBT Welcome. And we started the lab in 2020, we set up the infrastructure. <laughs> First thing we had to do was to create processes. We had to uh, make sure things are standardized. We, uh, we had to bring people together. And now we are running a largest prospective radiomics <coughs> trial and it's still on ongoing. So once we set up this pipeline, what we realized that, so this is the pipeline that we have published. Uh, and we have, we were able to actually uh, collaborate with other uh, Mastro clinic and then see how this model can be taken forward. We, we employed the federated learning model, which is that not sharing the images, but letting the algorithm travel from one place to another, which Andre would be explaining in the third talk today. Uh, but one, one important thing that we learned is that when we look at data sets, which are already present in data banks, there is a time trend bias or a technology bias because what, what is stored in the past, the technology acquisition, CT acquisition technology would have changed, the standardization has changed, and more importantly in radiation oncology, the co contouring, how you define a tumor has changed over time. So this would influence your prediction model. So that's one important lesson that we learned. So once we set up this pipeline, we also opened up to other clinicians and then we had uh, Dr. Jabba who's who came forward and asked, can you use the same thing in predicting a complete pathological response in rectal cancer? And with Anuradha and her team, we built this model. It's a simple model, but we, what we learned is that the baseline MRI, what it predicts, is the most important prediction. And whatever you do subsequently after you initiate the treatment, that prediction is not going to change. <coughs> so that's a, that's a small data set, but it's a good lesson for us. Then we had the neurosurgery group from Dr. Ari Chako who was asking us whether we can use the MR images to classify uh, non-functioning pituitary adenomas because he wanted to know before surgery that whether these pituitary adenomas are high risk or low risk. And we went about doing that and we got a 74% accuracy in that model. It is not externally validated, but it was a learning experience as we went forward. Then another venture that we had was a delta radium. That's like, uh, this is unique to radiation oncology because yesterday Shantam explained to you that we take multiple corn beam CT scans as the patients go through six weeks of radiation. So when I have a lung cancer patient who is having radiation daily, we are collecting CT data on a daily basis. And I can, I de we deployed rad radiomics in it to detect early pneumonitis changes in these patients which how does it help us? If I know patient is developing pneumonitis, I would be able to start them on steroids and avert a clinical pneumonitis later. So that's also one new lesson that we had. That's all about imaging related AI research. Then we had this question which has been longing on our side. Most of you would have used uh, quality of life questionnaires or the PROMS, patient reported outcome modules. and. We all clearly know we use it very well in research, but we don't actually use it in clinics. Why? Because it's cumbersome. Patient comes to the clinic, fills up a form, and then gives it to the doctor. Doctor has to score it, and this doesn't happen outside of research. So we wanted to transform the way that this is done. We want to, in the era of digital wearables and mobile phones, where they're collecting data of heart rate, BP, etc. Why not these can be collected on a real-time basis as responses to the patient? Like a Facebook. Facebook is actually uh, looking at your responses and curating uh, advertisements for you. Similar to that, we should be able to capture human responses on uh, specific domains. For example, a depression domain I want to monitor, I, I should be able to do that. So for that, we wrote up and we had good funding from IDEA, which is a Geneva-based virtual health uh, uh, agency. And this is now uh, envisioned in three steps where first step we would actually develop a universal uh, open source software in which we would uh, put in some uh, prompt questionnaires, test it, iteratively modify and then open it up for a crowdsourcing within CMC and outside 
and we have Tata Calcutta uh, and Shantam's team uh, collaborating with us on that. And ultimately, once we have a huge data bank, we feel that AI would help us, uh, help us make these questions simple and ask the right question to the right patient when he's in the right mood at the right time. So that, that's, that uh, reduces redundancy and increases responsiveness. And when they come to the doctor, actually the dashboard shows what actually the trend is. And also, yesterday I asked uh, about the uh, NLP. That's because we want to actually simplify these questions so that the existing translation engines can be connected and it can be universal into all languages. So the final uh, question is, when, once we set up this lab and the pipeline, we started collaborating and this is a, uh, Argos is a big uh, uh, deep learning approach that Andre is leading across the world. And what they are trying to do is to create auto segmentation tools for lung cancer. And we are now invited to be part of that because we have created this uh, infrastructure. So <laughs> along with this, we also had uh, various other departments because we opened up asking us questions on AI. Many of them th throw us a question with small data sets, which probably we felt <laughs> they weren't passionate enough to bring, uh, take it forward. They say, you take the question and you do what you want. That doesn't help us because we already have a lot of work to do. But when we have a committed physician who want to actually find a solution for a patient, that makes a difference. And that's where I would uh, commend Dr. Emmanuel, who came to us one day and said, see, I have these patients in the clinics who have to travel quite a lot of distance uh, hundreds of kilometers, pay 20,000 rupees, come to me and for two seconds I see their post-operative wound and I tell them it's normal and they go back. And that actually made him think, why should we do that? I have a set of photographs which I've taken of all these patients, thousands of them. Why can't we use it to create a model or an app? And I felt that is a low-hanging fruit, clinically translatable and very relevant to his patients and and we are actually supporting it now we have a committed clinician a, a very relevant question and the technology to support it and now next step is probably to go ahead with funding and uh, Emmanuel we have a lot of funders here and I would actually um, show him here so that anybody who is interested in this question can reach out to him the final thing what we are now now CMC after many years have moved on to digital pathology uh, in the leadership of Dr. Gita Chako, and it is very passionate for Dr. Joy Maman, that the same pathway that we created in radiomics can be deployed in pathology to, you, to answer similar questions. Can be classification, can be prognostication, and this is called pathomics. And this is our next step, which we are eagerly awaiting. So next few slides, before I conclude, I would actually talk to you about lessons when you ask the questions in lessons I learned when we started asking these questions. First, ask, when you ask the right question, as I said, it has to be clinically relevant with good impact on healthcare. And many a time we see small projects, burst of ideas, small data set, whatever that comes out is not clinically translatable or it just doesn't work even within your clinic. So <laughs> that's something which we need to avoid. We have to think bigger when, and think, think with multiple people a larger collaboration has to be thought of. <clears throat> Clinician can always have an overall idea. Many a time I've seen clinicians actually coding and sitting and doing deep learning, machine learning models. I don't know whether that should be our strength. Our strength is seeing the clinic uh, patients and finding the right question. We should have an overall idea, but this should not be uh, our job of uh, doing. So we should get good people, good data scientists to uh, move with us on these questions. In designing an AI study, the utility and impact of AI determines the study. But again, uh, this is one thing that I always tell people about prognostic modeling, that uh, what are you going to use the prognostic model for? For example, he is going to use a screening tool for uh, not bringing normal wounds to the clinic. So if I am going to develop a model, then I have to have a very sensitive prognostic marker, means the false positive rate is kept very high. So, so th that confusion matrix has to come in when you ask that question. <coughs> Again, from our example, uh, the communication between the clinician and the data scientist. When we did the pituitary uh, adenoma study, 
um, Hannah and uh, Amal spent a lot of time, and then they finally came up with a Eureka moment where, where they were able to uh, clearly classify a functioning pituitary adenoma versus a non-functioning pituitary adenoma. And when they approached the neurosurgeons, they said, see, why did you have to do it? Because we have a simple blood test to do this. So why did that happen? Because they had given these as controls, but the data scientist doesn't know what is functional, what is non-functional. So there should be a good communication and when the doctor is asking the question and working with the data scientist. Retrospective data. Many of us feel free to actually, we can learn on retrospective data, but I, I just mentioned earlier, there is, there is a strong change in technology over time, especially in the last decade. So you should actually look at your question, whether it will stand the test of time and whether the change in technology will impact it, and then only you should be able to use retrospective data. <coughs> standardization. So we, we, do deploy, we did employ standardization techniques in acquiring CT scans when we did the radiomix, but it has to be a balanced approach. If I standardize too much, then the uh, generalizability of AI is lost, because if I do it, create a model, standardized model, I take it to Shantam's hospital, it won't work there. So there should be a balance when we standardize things. Those were the lessons. We had challenges. And when you start off, also you will have challenges. When we started, we had detractors. Everyone was heard. We had an open invitation to collaborate. Uh, uh, we had skeptics. But one thing that uh, in the leadership of Dr. Simon uh, said, let's do this, but nothing will stop us. And that's why we are here. And uh, thanks to that. The major uh, hindrance that we found was non-mineable data, especially in my department, we had a parallel EMR, which was on paper for radiation oncology, which was non-mineable. So uh, I am thankful to the department because they stood with me in actually changing from pa paper to paperless, and we are actually 50% paperless in the department right now. Uh, along with research office and direction of Dr. Joy Maman, we have created a core group of 10 people, I think, who is actually involved in <coughs> creating an AI group. And we have put in a corpus using our research funds and we have created a uh, biomedical informatics research data warehouse. We call it the BIRD, which sits in uh, the principal's office. It's a, a rack which has good computational power. And we are actually encouraging all the researchers to come and connect to it remotely so that you can use, utilize the computational power. When we set up that, we also introduce a checklist into our institutional ethics committee forms, wherein the question is asked to the researcher whether your research question involves AI. This is not a regulatory thing. This is a facilitatory thing. If they say yes, then they connect to us. We are going to tell them, see, we have the expertise to direct you and modify the question. We have the technology here. Don't try and duplicate that. So that's what is happening right now. So if you see that question in the IEC, uh, IRB form, and you feel that your AI will be regulated, it's not that, it is a facilitatory question. So administrative challenges, equipment, space, and most importantly, we were asked what was the revenue model and where is the service component, and thankfully, Dr. J.V. Peter was silently supporting us for those many years when we started, and our answer is we are not here to make 10 papers in the next one year. We are here to see how CMC can go forward in the next 10 years down the line, we should have AI solutions. For that, we have to start building now, building good data, clean data, and a good awareness among people about data sharing and collecting quality data. Universal challenges, I won't explain this because <coughs> this is out, even outside of CMC. There is a question about data security and privacy. We heard about the Chavi model where all the uh, data is actually collated in one place. We will also hear the personal health train model, which Andre would be saying, you can judge yourself. There are regulatory challenges, which I think Anita explained yesterday, and we would be listening to Ramanjit today about another side of it. So finally, to conclude, what we need for the right question in AI, I personally feel the foremost thing is a passionate clinician with a relevant and a translatable question. We don't need clean data. All data points have to be captured efficiently. It is a continuous process and it's not a one-time process that you do in uh, a retrospective research or a single point research. It has to be a, a practice change. A transformative vision in data sharing is needed 
altruistic approach is needed and most importantly we need clinical and industry partnerships because we don't want AI models to be generated and sit with you. We want it to be available universe, universally and that's where the industry comes in. So uh, CMC is a good ground for all this and, and if you are not utilizing this, that's, that's a loss. So this is our group, the AI group that uh, when Andre came visiting, we actually used this picture two weeks back for the Women's Day uh, thing. So because the, the theme was digital and uh, gender divide. But two weeks down the line, you can see we have a very good representation of women speakers here when we speak about AI. And thanks to my team for that. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take up more questions. Check. Thank you, Dr. Balu, for that very practical approach to the topic. The floor is now open for questions and comments. Sorry. Hi, Baluk. Uh, Andre from Astra. So thank you for, um, for a great um, overview. Uh, and I was wondering, as a physician, about the following, because I'm getting this back from my physicians. Um, because we use real-world data generally for AI development uh, <coughs> and for outcome predictions, um, we have to deal with the fact that that is observational data, right? Not, it's not randomized clinical trial data. Which means, for instance, if you're, doing a, you're trying to do an AI that will determine outcomes for, let's say, surgery and lung cancer versus radiotherapy or stereotactic radiotherapy, right? Um, because the surgeons only select the healthy patients and radiotherapy gets the bad patients, right? Radiotherapy will always have worse outcomes. It's a confounding problem, right? So the, it's confounding. Uh, so you, the, the choice of therapy in our clinics is not random. It's based on things that also determine, for instance, survival, like a bad general condition. So when I learn an AI model from data, my clinician would say, well, Andre, that's nice, but this is uh, not a causal model, right? It is just a correlative model. And so you can't use such a model to choose between surgery and radiotherapy, because radiotherapy will always lose, right? Um, what's your opinion on that? Should we, is that, um, is that fair criticism or, and should we go into route of more causal models, which, which we can, right? Or do you think as a physician, well, you know, it's useful nonetheless, even though I know it's correlative. I think it's a, it's a fair assessment of the AI solution that is there. Uh, the clinician is right there. And, uh, what I would say as a solution is, for example, in India, the approach is very heterogeneous. If, if you have a very good surgeon in the clinic, then that center is going to have more and more patients being operated. But we have many other clinics where even the healthy patient undergo chemo radiation instead of surgery. So my answer is your approach is the right one where you are trying to collaborate and then get data from the other centers and that, that would actually improve the model. Uh, hi, I I'm Sandeep. So I work as a research engineer in University of Oslo, Norway. Um, I would just, uh, before asking the question, I would, be, I would like to share how I ended up in this conference. Uh, so I'm from Velour. So I was accompanying my mom to the hospital last week. <laughs> I saw this poster and I, I signed up. Um, you know, uh, and being a Velourian, CMC is always part of our lives. Like it, it, in all aspects, CMC is part of our Velourian's life, and I'm so glad that this symposium is happening in uh, CMC Velour. Uh, so, question is about the eProms project that uh, yes. you are doing. So, you mentioned that you use RedCap and Facebook. You plan or use or you plan to use RedCap and uh, Facebook. So, sorry, I'll correct you there. I mean, uh, I, I, it's just an analogy. Mm -hmm. The pr solution would look like a RedCap to the physician end and a Facebook to the patient end. Right. That, that's the analogy I use. It's not that we are going to use RedCap and Facebook. Right. So, so uh, okay, what, what kind of uh, tools to use for uh, surveys and assessments? Uh? Uh, so our idea is to use the existing uh, tools which are already there. Uh, I mean, thousands of them for each domain which is already validated. So our idea is that we, uh, once if we prove our so open source software is good, we would have buy-in and people coming and using it for their research, which automatically leads to a crowdsourcing of data of uh, 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 thousands of questionnaires in one questions in one place, and that's where NLP and uh, AI can come in and collate what is relevant, uh, reduce the redundancy of questioning. I mean, you you ask the same question every day instead of that, the AI should be able to choose the right question for the right domain that it is asked to monitor by the doctor. So 
this is a i would say it's a pathfinder project a pathfinder project means you start with a larger vision but as we get into it we are ready to change our path based on what we learn